Right. Well, um, thank you for joining us, everyone. And apologies for the slight delay. I had to re-download Zoom because for some reason it decided not to work. Um, I am Adam Ramsey. I am editor at Open Democracy. Um, I'm here in lieu of our editor-in-chief, Mary Fitzgerald, who is away this week. Um, as many of you will know, Open Democracy exists to challenge power and inspire change. And we're very keen that the exciting conversation we're going to have shortly involves all of you. So um, thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions and comments ahead of time. We're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can. And if you're joining us on Zoom, some people are on Facebook, but if you're on Zoom, then you can submit comments to us in the chat and those will be fed through our ingenious systems to our chair. Um, if you're on Facebook, then you can also add comments and that will also be fed back. Um, if you are not already signed up to Open Democracy's weekly newsletter, then you should be. So please um, sign up at opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter. And most importantly of all to say that um, these online discussions are happening obviously under lockdown. All of us are at home. My dog wandered into this room a moment ago. Some people might well be sat at home with their children. Um, we kind of expect it to be a little bit informal and things might not always go brilliantly. Um, but that is half the fun of the occasion. And we're very excited to welcome our panel tonight, but I'm not going to introduce them. I'm just going to introduce you to our wonderful chair who is sat in Nieringhaza in Eastern Hungary, where I spent a lovely couple of days in February this year interviewing uh, supporters and people who didn't support Viktor Orban. But um, Reka is, I think, probably fair to say in the latter of those categories. Um, and uh, Reka Kingapap is the editor-in-chief of Eurozine magazine, which is a fantastic journal and network of journals right across Europe, and a Hungarian journalist herself. And I will hand you over to her now. Thanks for the kind introduction, Adam, and I'm really glad to be with you this time. Uh, thanks for the invitation from Open Democracy, and indeed I am streaming from my cousin's childhood uh, bedroom, so I hope you enjoy the setup. That is all the words I have to waste on this, and let me also welcome our panelists for today. Obviously, the occasion why we're here is uh, the latest, well, it's not an article, it's, it's basically half a book by um, our um, Lucia's guest, Anthony Barnett, on Open Democracy under the title, From the Belly of Hell. Uh, sorry, I already messed up, Out of the Belly of Hell. Um, and Anthony has attempted um, understanding, well, basically uh, global, globalizing history since 1968 and a bit further too, up until this point and understanding what, what occasion or what opportunity is in front of us. And we will be discussing this uh, vast body of text with uh, Thea Rio Frankis, um, who is here with us from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Is that true? Hi, Thea. She's a um, political scientist and author of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal and also the book Resource Radicals. She is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College. Nice to have you here. And, um, it, and I, I'm a bit starstruck. I have to maybe just put it on the table first uh, because I'm a huge fan, uh, fan of Ashion Bemba and his work, who is here with us. He's the philosopher and political scientist who developed the idea of necropolitics how politics can dictate who lives and who dies, which seems not again, but still up uh, today, very relevant and quite definitive about both um, the coronavirus di discourse and how politics is playing out and, um, and what we try to do with this crisis. He's research professor at the, at the Bits Institute of, uh, for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg, South Africa, and his books include critique of black reason uh, on post-colony and necropolitics. And I, of course, forgot to mention that Anthony Barnett is, uh, <laughs> as if it weren't on, um, basically the point is a co-founder of Open Democracy and the um, author of um, obviously Out of the Belly of Hell, the essay that we are discussing today. Um, 
which looks at social movements since uh, 68 to have reshaped yeah. the world. So okay. let's get to it and let's start with Anthony. I'm really glad to, to e-meet you, to use this weird word. Yeah. And uh, let's just start with a very blunt, open question. What made you write a brief, very personal and quite North Atlantic, but, but um, still quite vast history of, uh, well, neoliberalism and how it has been guiding globalization since 1968. Right, right. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm very happy to be here and it's very uh, uh, delightful to be part of an, a really international discussion. I'm very honored to have this because I think one of the things that the virus has done is it's a lot of people are closed into the, the mortality rates of their own country and the crisis of their own country very intensely. And so it's great to be to be in a in a much wider global discussion in the, the beginning of this, and uh, I'm really here to listen and to learn. Uh, what what I wrote is something which I wrote very fast through the uh, through the first weeks of the lockdown, um, and it's really an exploration, a beginning to try and think through what's happening. And so the reason I wrote it was, I think that at the beginning of this year we were in a kind of what I thought was a sort of doom loop, which is that you had had uh, 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 you'd have the incredible uh, climate uh, uh, protest led by Greta Th Thunberg, and it had been dismissed by Trump. Uh, in my country, you had had uh, Johnson sweeping aside the, the Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party to get a huge majority. Uh, you would have this incredible movement for really quite modest reform, but deeply important one led by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren in America. And out of that, you have the weakest possible contender against Trump, it seemed to me, in Biden. Um, and, and worst of all, you had this economic boom taking place. So I think one of the things that had happened was that we were in a neoliberal world order uh, which, which gave primacy to global corporations and to the marketplace and did so by attacking government and by depoliticizing people. Um, and with the great crash, the financial crash of 2008, when the, the governments had to come to rescue the economy, that, that, that ideology, if you like, of neoliberalism went into crisis and it reinvented itself in these populists like Trump uh, and Macron and uh, Johnson, who um, who were it, it sort of repoliticized the support for global power, and it seemed to me that they were they were letting rip with an economic expansion, which would certainly come to an end, but probably last in November, and therefore we're going to see the re-election of Trump in November. And I couldn't see any way out of this. It seemed to me the forces that were destroying the world were funding the electoral systems, which were actually going to reinforce those forces into power. And then the virus arrived and the virus blew a whistle on this uh, in a very, very extraordinary way. Obviously, the people in power didn't change their, their stripes. They wanted to stay in power. They wanted to keep their own system going. But to do so, they had to close down a third of the economy. They've started the, the most precipitous financial crash in world history. And they did this as policies. And we didn't win the argument. But they did it nonetheless. So I had to ask myself in this surprising situation, why did this happen? And the answer, it seemed to me that there were forces in the globalization, in the, what I regarded globalization kind of sandpit, a playground of neoliberalism. There had been forces in it at work which were producing, which were really a counter to the whole neoliberal project. One was feminism in all sorts of forms. Another was the development of human rights, both legal, which is very important, which had happened over the last 50 years, but also the sense of people making a claim of right, which was reinforced by the attacks on patriarchy and you know, passivity. And another uh, was the ecological arguments, which I think had gone deep into people's sense that we have to do something about the world. And, and a fourth was the uh, a shift in the nature of democracy, partly due to the financial crash, governments could govern, um, but also partly due to the rise of the internet, which had many bad features, but it did have a sense of empowering. And something you've seen in this century, I'm a kind of democratic activist from the last century, is 
uh, the rise of things like citizens' assemblies, direct democracy, the sense that we have we, we can communicate with each other, the capacity to communicate via telephone and so on, and internet messaging. And this had shifted in, in deep ways, not the official politics, but the deeper balance of power. And it seemed to me that, that, that a humanization of globalization had taken place inside neoliberalism, which doesn't have a proper political articulation, but could have that. And it's not, I say this particularly in, in, to, to, to salute uh, Echie and the work that you've done, it's not European, we are, we are the humanists with sort of colonialism and slavery and genocide uh, underneath it. It is a humanization of pluralism, of difference, of multitudes, of complexity, uh, not a singularity. But, and this is the last thing I would say, but it was brought about in part because health, our bodies, the sense that we are now a species that the virus has taught us, and we are now conscious agents of what is it teaching us, means that there is a new sense, a material sense of our humanity being shared, which I think is, is very new and, and is very, very welcome. And so I think out of this, out of this deeply right-wing moment, uh, will come a long left-wing uh, response. And it will be the opposite of 68. 68 was a left-wing moment, which led to 40, 50 years of, of right-wing development has brought us to Trump on the edge of his second term. Uh, but now I think the terms are going to be reversed. That, that's... Yeah, sorry, you said just... I'm struggling technically to unmute myself. Uh, thank you for for uh, this like very short recap. I would advise everyone to take to the original text um, and uh, and pledge the time because it's also a very enjoyable read. I do have a question for you though before I ask the panelists to um, to share their reflections or maybe amend your your view. Um, there is uh, this very strong motivation uh, in your text that you make very explicit that you want to draw um, a more positive uh, scenario. You, you say that you see it, but there is a sort of prophetic, a prophetic element to telling this potential future it is, a, is a bit of creation by will, isn't it? So basically we are all drawing positive scenarios because we would like to see them. How much responsibility is there for a campaigner or uh, who has been involved in, in uh, uh, human rights movement and democratization movements um, that drives you to say that this is possible without always putting out the disclaimer that of course something else is also possible? And how much do you think it is uh, inevitable? That's also a notion that you tend to refuse. Well, it's, uh, that's a very, very profound and important question. It obviously isn't inevitable, right? We are on the edge of a, uh, a, a planetary catastrophe and there are going to be more. The, the locusts of, uh, from, that have gone from East Africa to India um, are partly, partly coming about through climate change uh, are another signal of the of what we're doing to the planet. So it, it's clearly not inevitable. And one of the things that I don't make much of, but I feel very profoundly, is the failure of movements of the will, as you put it, the failure of uh, uh, the the great NGOs which tried to transform the world, the failure of the alt globalization movement, which was an attempt to stop globalization through an act of the will. And I talk about the failure of the Porto Alegre, the World Social Forum. And, and my argument is part of what I'm, I'm trying to explore, which is why your question cuts right to the chase for me, is what kind of alliance of forces is needed to turn this moment into something which is positive. And there I feel I'm very sketchy, I'm exploring that. I'm convinced that there has to be, we all have to change if we are going to uh, uh, change the world. We have to change our, you know, socialist politics or our NGO no best or our elitism. We've all got, the, uh, uh, it's out of those alliances that some kind of a, a sufficient force can be built. 
It can't just be done because we all say we've got the right answer and if we all, all wave the right banner, it will happen. Well, one of the one of the chapters in the text or the first chapter is called We Were All Wrong. Um, and you are basically arguing that that um, history as it played out has never been inevitable, even though this was a political project to make it seem inevitable. So we're going to avoid that. Although I do realize uh, or did realize during your response that maybe um, the willpower is not the most fortunate expression because then the triumph of the will pops to mind. Yeah. And that's yeah, that's not a, an association a Hungarian should want to make about history, given right. our involvement. So sorry for that. But let me then ask uh, first, uh, without any particular uh, reason of importance um, or order of importance, because that is uh, not something I would come up uh, with being, uh, between our panelists, but let me ask Thea first, um, who recently co-authored an article for the Jacobin Mag by the title, We Can Waste Another Crisis, or We Can Transform the Economy, which is, um, which is a very thick summary of the situation or a very thick assessment of the situation in itself, in which um, uh, she and her co-authors are arguing that the financial crisis of 2008 was a, a painfully wasted opportunity where uh, global financial systems could have been um, very thoroughly transformed, especially for um, the uh, for the benefit of uh, ecology with a with a greener mind, and uh, she uh, or or they do um, emphasize a strong critique of the Obama administration, which now in comparison, of course, seems flawless and amazing. And I do have to admit that Obama was a gentleman, you know, <laughs> if that's if that's all you long for. But you also do see a, a, a criticize in this piece. Um, Biden and the promise of restoring something uh, from the before times. Would you care to tell us your perspective on the crisis right now, what kind of opportunity it holds, and also what you see from Anthony's piece that you would maybe want to develop further? Yeah, thank you for the great questions and Anthony for that summary and reflection um, on, your, on your long essay. Um, I'm going to sort of zoom out a little bit and then I, I'll, I'll come back to the, the question of opportunity um, at, at the end of my uh, brief comments. So this, this whole event um, that, that we're participating in right now was framed by a question. Uh, right now, governments across the world have been forced to shut down their economies and put life first. And this seems to reverse the normal logic of capitalism where profits come before people, right? And so what, what is happening is sort of the, the question and what opportunities does it, does it um, open up? Um, I guess, you know, in, in broadest terms, it seems that the, the COVID uh, pandemic is symptomatic of a contradiction between global capitalism and its own microbiological foundations. Um, and just as the climate crisis is symptomatic of a tension between capitalism and its macrobiological and atmospheric uh, uh, conditions of possibility. Um, and both, both the pandemic and, and the climate crisis, the latter of which is something that I work on much more uh, directly, um, takes the form of this kind of tension between what capital accumulation requires, what economic growth requires, what profitability requires, and what socio-natural reproduction, just like the, the, uh, the, the kind of availability of, of life, both human and, and other, for capital to exploit and to act as consumers and workers, right? So capital, obviously, capitalism requires some conditions of, of socio-natural existence in order to function, but it continually, through its own operations, threatens those very conditions, right? So that's an ongoing contradiction of capitalism, which you know many thinkers, um, including people on this panel, have, have diagnosed, um, but is particularly salient in a moment of public health crisis or in a moment of, of climate crisis. Um, so in, in this moment of a tension between social and natural well-being um, and capital accumulation, certainly many governments around the world have shut down spheres of economic activity in order to, in a sense, preserve the basis for future economic activity. 
activity, right? Which is like a, you know, semi-healthy population um, in the case of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, we could say certainly, and I think that there's something uh, to um, uh, Anthony's point and to the prompt of, of the panel that this involves putting people over profits. Um, but, you know, I think that something else I would add that I don't suspect Anthony disagrees with, but just to highlight, is that the very um, dramatic variations in government response um, in terms of, you know, between governments around the world or even in the US or other federal systems, you know, between different subnational governments. We have a lot of variety of, of policy response. Um, and I think part of what that variation shows is how deeply a, a certain economic logic, that logic of capital accumulation and profitability um, and the protections of markets and private property, how deeply that economic logic, as well as the racial, gender, and geographic inequalities that are deeply bound up with that economic logic, um, have shaped um, what Ashil, you know, is probably will talk about more and has talked about in his prior work, has shaped the, what, you know, the distribution of life and death, um, of health and sickness, of who gets to live and who doesn't, right? So, so in the current moment, even as governments and, and particularly the more progressive governments in the world prioritize um, human health over, over market um, exchanges, uh, the, who is dying and who is living and who is getting sick and who isn't and who is forced to work, um, otherwise they starve and who has the luxury of staying at home like I do and some of us you know, do, um, is, is already so deeply shaped by, um, by that, by the, uh, by the sort of neoliberal logic of how the economy has been or organized for several decades and shaped by much longer history of colonialism, imperialism, and, and global capitalism as well. Um, and you know, I think that this is quite clear. I don't want to speak beyond my areas of, of ex my geographic areas of expertise, but you know, I think in, in the UK, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Latin America, and in Southern Europe, which are precisely the places where neoliberal austerity um, has been, you know, pretty intensified recently. They're not the only places in the world where that's the case. So I'm, I, again, I, I want to like frame that I'm not going to speak to places in the world that I'm less knowledgeable about their their recent policy um, uh, policy frameworks. But certainly in in sort of Anglo America, in the UK, the US, in Latin America, and in Southern Europe, there have been decades of brutal neoliberal austerity, as well as a deeply racialized class structure um, that is racialized, you know, in, in racial terms and ethnic terms and in terms of who is a citizen and, and who isn't. And those we could say the, the neoliberal austerity and the racialized class structure are the pre-existing conditions to use a kind of medical metaphor, um, are the pre-existing conditions that exacerbate the spread of disease and mortality rates, but also in very unequal ways that predispose certain populations more than others to disproportionate risk and a risk of infection, a risk of mortality that's already layered on top of a risk of deportation, a risk of eviction, a risk of job loss, right? These were pre-existing symptoms of neoliberal austerity. And now we have a sort of new um, set of symptoms layered on top of that. Um, and in those same contexts, and I can definitely speak to the US and Latin America in this regard, where elites are already threatening to impose or actually implementing austerity as a response to the economic crisis. They're saying, well, we, we don't have much economic activity right now. Our tax revenues are down. We have to cut services, right? So we can already see that like the way that, you know, this is a more pessimistic read. I'll come to more optimistic reads in a moment, but the way that the public health crisis could provide new forms of justification for the very austerity that makes the, these types of crises worse, right? And so we see elites, um, some elites, not all, um, you know, there's, there's variety among elites, but certainly, you know, in, in Ecuador this past week, we had mass protests against an austerity response on the part of the government of Ecuador um, that involves um, further cutting of social services, which is one of the reasons that Ecuador in the first place was one of the worst places in Latin America in terms of COVID. Um, in addition, across the global south, you have the condition of crushing sovereign debt, which is really limiting government's room of maneuver to address the social crisis, um, uh, the pandemic in the present, but you know also the unfolding climate crisis as well. Um, you know, but so those are the more pessimistic and maybe structural kind of reads. Um, but I do think that there are political openings um, and we're witnessing that even in the, the belly of this decaying imperial power of the United States. Um, you know, we're seeing, re I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, pretty active in it. And, um, you know, it's amazing to see as someone that 
is is a member of a socialist organization like how 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 many demands for things like decommodification for universal services um, for for government response oriented towards social welfare are resonating very broadly right so we see demands in the us and these are these are demands these are social demands rooted in in organizing but ha that have made their way into congressional legislation in some cases even in very watered down form but you know still they are resonating in the political system so i'll just list some of them we're seeing demands to cancel rent um to just no more no rent payment during the crisis and that's a demand that comes out of tenant organizing in the us um we're seeing demands for moratoria on bill payments for essential services many of which are privatized in the us energy water internet you know those essential services we're seeing demands to to not to not have to pay for them right now or at least not get them shut off for 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 lack of uh, ability to pay we're seeing of course demands for universal health care demands for direct income support demands for the state coordination of supply chains. Of course, those can have a right and a left-wing valence, depending. So I don't want to say that's always a left-wing proposal, but it can be. Um, we're seeing demands for um, the protection um, uh, on welfare and safety of essential workers. Um, and those demands come from those workers themselves. We've seen some amazing strikes recently, Amazon workers, Instacart workers. Um, uh, and you know, I think there's something deeper here, which is not just those discrete labor struggles as important as they are, but also what I was saying earlier about the social reproductive labor that capitalism depends on, but always sort of devalorizes or invisibilizes or externalizes. We're seeing like a visibility around social reproductive labor, something that feminist socialists have written about, you know, for, for a long time, but, but now is like part of the sort of public discussion. Um, and so, you know, with all of these potential interventions, these social demands and, and potential interventions and some actual interventions that have occurred in the US and in governments around the world, you know, we could, as Anthony, um, you know, suggests, or, or I guess as the prompt of the event to suggest in a more optimistic register, think about, you know, is this pointing to a world beyond capitalism? Is this prefiguring an economic system that does not, is not organized around profit, but rather organized around the safety and well-being of people and, and the planet? Um, or a little more maybe pessimistically or in a real politique kind of register, we could think of this as maybe it's a world pointing to a world beyond neoliberalism or neoliberal globalization, but it's really going to you know, result in a just new form of capitalism that might be even worse, if it's possible to imagine, than the existing form we have. We could get into that with, with the debate. Um, I think there are different possibilities, but it's certainly a moment of opening, um, as many many thinkers have said um, uh, that you know, crises are, are moments of, of political opening and, and also moments in which the deeper structures and inequities and forms of domination that uphold a given system are revealed in a much more clear way. Um, I think it's too soon to tell which road we're going down. And of course, a lot of it hinges on those alliances that Anthony was getting at at the end. You know, what is going to be the array of political forces? How is capital and, and, and elite interests going to reorganize themselves? How are popular interests going to create new alliances? All of this is too soon to tell. But I think you know these these will be the political battles. Like, how does the state intervene in the economy? Um, that's a political battle right now with the COVID-induced economic depression. It, it is also a battle that relates to climate crisis and the need for forms of state intervention. Um, and we are, I think, in the in the U.S. and in economies around the world, of course. But I'm just speaking from the U.S. right now at this very critical juncture for you know, are we going to preserve? the economy as it exists and all of the ways that the economy subordinates human life, subordinates the planet um, and, and contributes to racial and gender oppression, or are we going to move in a different direction with an economy that is egalitarian, that is green, that is low carbon, that is resilient for ordinary people, not just for like capital and supply chains, but really um, uh, it, it provides a secure livelihood for, for ordinary people. Um, so are we gonna kind of take this moment and build a different economy out of out of the rubble of what, what we're witnessing unfold? Um, or are we gonna double down as we did? And just, I'll go back to the opening uh, comments, you know, as I was, you know, were referenced the 2009 uh, recovery in the US, um, you know, we really just made the, made the economy even worse in 2009, more financialized, more unequal, the racial wealth gap increased um, tremendously. Uh, so everything got worse in a way. Um, uh, but what didn't get worse is that we did see a resurgence of 
left wing and social movement demands in the wake of that crisis. And this is what Anthony is referring to. And so, you know, we, uh, the, you know, things move in, in, in both directions at once. Some things get worse and, and, and then new possibilities open up. So I think we are at a critical juncture um, and I will leave it there to hear what others have to say. Thank you, and just shamelessly plugging something that you have already mentioned. We, uh, in your zine, recently published the story of the organizing of the Los Angeles tenants movement, who were one of the few who organized the rent strike and started on the 30th of April. You can find it under the title La Comuna o Nada, and we will also be publishing a lot about housing, access to housing, the financialization of the housing markets, and what it does to people and also what it could do to people instead throughout the year. So stick with yours in if you're interested in that kind of thing. And as most humans are pretty vulnerable to volatile housing markets, you should be. But apart from that, I think uh, you have already kind of uh, made the stage for Achille, uh, who obviously has, uh, it said it doesn't need um, much, of a, much of an introduction to be a very relevant uh, thinker in the situation. And uh, Ashir, you have already warned uh, about this in, uh, in other media appearances uh, that this crisis must not be used as an opportunity to further curtail our freedoms and, um, and impose even more uh, mechanisms that restricts people's uh, freedoms and intervene in their lives even deeper. Um, let me also briefly quote, um, well, more or less quote from your uh, article, Deglobalization, which again, you can find in Eurozine uh, and was published originally in our French partner journal, Esprit. Uh, you say that quantification, artificialization and automation um, are leading to an unprecedented unification of the planet but it is no longer a physical world so much as a reticular one, but this ubiquitous instantaneous world populated by connection devices and all sorts of prosthetics is confronted by another world, the old world of bodies and distances, materials and areas, fractured spaces and borders. It is a world of separation. You argued about this um, uh, about a year and a half ago um, on the, uh, or uh, talking about borders and borderification um, and talking about how we restrict the freedom of movement of people and how we deny personhood basically or the, the basic humanity to certain people uh, to ensure the comfort of others. Um, you also draw attention to the, the main liberal contradiction that Anthony and Thea have also mentioned, that liberalism both promises, um, promises freedom and demands security. And this is a paradox that it has never been able to resolve. And here we are in a, in a well, probably not that unprecedented, but not, not to this degree documented and mediated uh, crisis where security is key and it seems to be more important than economy. Um, and people are talking about, um, political leaders are also uh, bringing this up that they should maybe just let the pandemic swipe through the population and get, get rid of a certain number of disposable people. What's your take on this or what's your first thought on this? Do you see this uh, current moment as an opportunity or do you more have dire warnings and worries about this? What's, uh, what's your angle? First of all, I'm very happy to, to see Anthony and then Thea and to share the, uh, the platform with them and, and yourself. Uh, my first thought, uh, I really cannot uh, not do this. Uh, goes to uh, the black man who was killed by the policeman in, in Minneapolis. I just cannot take that image out of my mind. And that, that happens right now. Uh, means something. I don't know what it means, but it's not uh, accidental. It's not accidental, neither, 
that uh, <clears throat> the last words of this black person were, if uh, I, I followed the story properly, I cannot breathe. This is what he said before, uh, indeed, uh, his last breath was, uh, was spent, so, so to see. And this question of breathing, um, to some extent, is part of what is at the heart of uh, this specific virus, in the sense that uh, ultimately, it cripples our capacity to breathe. And this question of breathing, the right to breathe and the capacity to breathe, it seems to me is also at uh, the heart of a number of questions Anthony raised in uh, the text, Thea referred to them, which are part of the key debate of this century which has to do with whether or not humanity, uh, Anthony used that term and I agree with him, we have to use it. Um, whether humanity is capable of inhabiting the planet anew. This question of inhabitation, inhabiting the planet anew, meaning sharing it, as equitably as possible. Sharing it being itself a precondition of its durability and its sustainability. It seems to me that this question will haunt this century we have just entered into. So uh, I understand therefore the attempt in Anthony's uh, text and the comments by Thea as being part indeed of the ways in which we can reinterrogate what Anthony calls globalization uh, from that perspective, from its capacity to uh, make a space of breathing for, for all of us. Uh, racially, gender, uh, religions, that doesn't matter, but something that can indeed uh, give meaning to, to this category he called humanity. He also mentioned species. We can go into that if you want. All of this is happening, I believe, at a time when our world is uh, witnessing a technological escalation uh, of an extent we have never seen before. I mean, historians love to say there's nothing new, but I really believe that there are, there are things that are new. And one of the things that is new, which is unprecedented, we have never seen it before, has to do with what I call technological escalation. Technological escalation, which paradoxically, seems to me, um, leaves us with more questions than answers. That technology nowadays is, is, is in, in fact uh, putting to us uh, multiple conundrums and paradoxes uh, it was supposed to, to resolve. It's not resolving them, it's leaving us with more and more problems which doesn't mean that I'm a technophobe. Uh, I'm not a technophobe at all. But I think that we, we need to reinterrogate the technological. We need to reinterrogate it because uh, at stake in the ongoing technological escalation is the fate of reason. The fate of reason in the sense that uh, we are entitled to ask ourselves, what is it that remains of uh, the human subject in um, an age when 
the uh, instrumentality of reason is increasingly carried out by and through information machines, for instance. When uh, it is carried out within and through technologies of calculation. And I wish Anthony could have addressed a bit more frontally that question uh, in, in, the, uh, in his text. Uh, I have the feeling that he, he passed over it uh, rather quickly and I would like to interpolate him uh, since I have that opportunity here. It seems to me questions such as, I mean, who will define the, uh, the set, who will set the boundary that distinguishes between the calculable and the incalculable, that is a key question of our time. I could uh, uh, list a number of others which uh, derive from the uh, technological escalation I have referred to, but I don't think we have that, that, that much time. I just wanted to bring that issue uh, on the table because it seems to me that both globalization, the uh, future of the state, um, the, uh, the universal right to breathe are at stake uh, in, 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 in this key uh, thing that is bringing us together and at the same time redistributing our life chances in the most unequal way we have ever seen before. Thank you, and the participants are uh, reacting. James Mackey writes that for anyone interested in following up this discourse on breathing, I highly recommend Bifo Berardi's book, which he wrote following the death of Eric Garner, whose last words were indeed the same as George Floyd, who, is, uh, who was um, the 46 year old man whose gruesome murdering was not only filmed, uh, but also shared widely on social media, which is yet again another horrifying question whether watching Black Death is something people should engage in just because it's available. Um, and what we think about the representation of somebody's suffering and death and, and not getting help when they need that. Um, but that's not the topic for today, even though I don't think that we can put that aside really. And I'm glad, Achille, you're, you're bringing this up because this is a very strong context for what we are talking about. Um, we also have um, a comment from uh, Michael Haupt who writes, it also comes at a time when the lungs of the planet were burning, the Amazon, Australia and California. It seems that the, the poetry of breathing is, uh, is pretty much resonating with our audience. But let me ask you some questions uh, posted by the attendees here and also in the registration forms. Uh, since uh, Thea has to leave relatively early, unfortunately, I think um, there's a bunch of questions which may be mostly addressed to her. Um, I will not read them all up, but they are basically the question about the upcoming election, whether this will be entirely decided by the, the US policy reactions or policy handling or mishandling of the pandemic and also whether Joe Biden should, should be viewed as an alternative or not. I'm not entirely sure this is, uh, this is so connected, even though I understand that, that US audiences must be very much thinking about this. Thea, would you care to respond? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely the, the policy response to, to COVID, um, but, but honestly, maybe even more so to the economic crisis uh, will be decisive in the US election and the timing of it could not be more perfect in the sense of how decisive it will be. You know, we have the election in, in November, but obviously we're already in campaign season. Um, and I, it, it, 
it's hard to keep track of all of the different prognostications in terms of the economy. Uh, definitely, we're in a severe crisis. We have over 30 million people in the U.S. that have applied for unemployment, which is like you know the most ever in in U.S. history, of course. And that and unemployment benefits undercount very dramatically how many people are unemployed, right? Because if you stop looking for work, you're not counted as unemployed. You're only unemployed if you're actively seeking employment, right? And so if you're so um, if you're so uh, frustrated by seek, looking for a job that you're not you're not actually um, um, unemployed anymore. So the statistics underdo it. Right now, I read in the New York Times this morning that there's going to be a whole spate of evictions in the U.S. Evictions meaning people being forced out of their homes because they did not pay rent or could not pay rent on time. It, this past month, we had a lot of like eviction moratoria or or forms of uh, temporary rental assistance but those have expired in most states and and federally and so people that are living at the margins of their income which is many many americans may be um homeless and add to our existing homeless crisis of course homelessness is itself always a public health issue for those that are that are homeless and now it's even more of a public health issue because it's impossible to abide by social distancing if you don't have a home so it, it you know that the, the economic crisis is very severe, but but there are different predictions as to how, you know, some people say this like makes Biden like a sure winner, no matter what he does, he could not campaign at all and he will win because people vote in ways that are very sensitive to their economic well-being. So if they're suffering, they'll just vote Trump out. Other people say that that the economy is going to cover recover um, uh, in a way that's rapid, even if it never recovers to where it was before and Trump will be able to tout all of the jobs added and the historic GDP growth versus the baseline of a very, you know, of a terrible situation right now. So there's all different um, predictions. And on addition to that, you have to sort of keep in mind that in the US, um, Americans are very politically polarized around the, viol uh, around the virus. I mean, I would say like probably the majority of Americans and their opinion polls uh, believe that the virus is real and believe that social distancing is important, but there's a vocal um, a minority of people that think that the virus is like a government hoax, that it's like the numbers are inflated, that social distancing is a uh, is a liberal conspiracy. And again, that's the minority of the US population, but they're very important to the Republican base, right? And they are very reliable voters. So it's, and yes, Biden is, is not an ideal candidate in ways that I do not need to express, I think, for this audience. So I think it's very concerning. If we have Trump reelected now, what that means for so many issues, uh, cl the climate crisis, um, and then the system of racialized violence that Ashil already spoke to um, uh, for African Americans in the US and also for um, uh, uh, um, undocumented immigrants is, is very scary. Um, and so that's a very scary prospect. Um, but I think right now it's um, Biden probably has an edge because it's pretty clear that Trump has, has handled this crisis quite badly. But uh, but the, the coming months could could give Trump the edge, and that's a very scary prospect. Okay, that's fun and encouraging. There's not, there's not going to be much encouragement here, I think. Um, at least we cannot expect um, much from the analysis of this uh, this election. So with that, I thank you, Thea, for being with us. Maybe if you can still stay for uh, a a bunch of minutes we'll see if we have questions for you i think we have something that i would most likely address to Ashil. uh robert morris writes in the chat how much do the panel feel that this crisis reveals pathologies of control where elites are attempting to preserve the illusion of sovereignty by enacting biopolitical controls in order to reify the sovereign state after the zombie social contract it once enshrined sovereignty which does not strictly speaking exist except now paradoxically within the context of pathogen induced incarceration i feel how how do you feel about this current situation reinforcing the nation states and uh, and maybe reinforcing some kind of long lost sovereignty yes it it will depend on, on a number of factors. Um, here in South Africa, for instance, the uh, coronavirus crisis is clearly um, helping the current uh, 
political regime to uh, uh, regain some, some legitimacy. And uh, the government is using the crisis as a way of uh, repurposing ideas of, of the nation in, in a society that is, as you all know, extremely fractured, especially along racial lines, but also along class gender, uh, gender lines. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, the, uh, the opportunities for a number of nation states to, uh, to reload themselves, uh, they, they, are, they do exist. And yet at the same time, it's a, a crisis of which we do not know that much. I mean, there is a huge unknown factor uh, in so far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. Uh, it's mutating extremely fast. Um, the uh, calculus between science and politics at least in our case here in South Africa, is, is quite unstable. Um, the government is involved in a kind of performance of control, although it doesn't really control that much. Um, so, so look, I would say that things, things are open, including for, for, for contestation. Uh, we, we won't know much until we, we see uh, how, how this uh, unfolds. And, and as far as we're concerned here, we haven't even reached the, uh, the peak yet. The peak is still to come. Yeah. Can I? Yes, please. Uh, so I, can I just respond to that? Because I think that point that, um, Chile has made is, is a very, very profound one. And I would, uh, so I'd like to have two, two responses. And one response to Taya, which I think should comes out of this, out of uh, uh, this point is that I think there's a, a danger of uh, those of us, especially those of us on the left, but not only on the left, I've seen it with other people of, of what one person called confirmation bias, that you look at a great crisis, and there's been some scientific work on this, and your immediate response is to double down on what you believe before only more strongly. And so I think we all have to ask ourselves, how are we going to change? How are we going to, what, what are we going to say that is now different from what we were saying before? Uh, and that may be a, take a long time or a long <laughs> process, but I think this process of, of, of being open uh, to, to seeing that this is a new situation for us and that the old, old answers which we have prepared or expectations um, have been shifted. And if you, if you um, fear the reinvention of this highly intelligent uh, uh, thing called capitalism, which has reinvented itself very relatively frequently, then that smartness, that intelligence, that, that flexibility is something that, uh, well, we better be a, 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 at least as good as that. And, and I think there's a real danger of reproducing the old language uh, more fiercely to, to, to uh, suggest that that is how to respond. And I think, so, in, and why um, Achille has done an extraordinary example of this. I mean, you have created a new right, the right to breathe. Uh, which um, is very profound. Everybody, I think, can immediately understand this. Uh, it had never occurred to me that one could demand the right to breathe. And yet, this is more than a metaphor. Uh, and I think that's, uh, and, and, and if I can answer your point about the technology, I think this is very difficult because, uh, but it, it is also, if you think about it, a question of breath. Can you breathe on the internet? Can you breathe on the world wide web? Is this a breathless, is it airless space, uh, this space or not? And I think the, the thing which I feel strongly, which I, I touched on um, is that 
It is, and, and this is also how, uh, uh, in parallel, the American military think about it. So they, the way they see it is that there is a new environment. There is land, there is sea, there's air on which they want a predominance, there's space, and now there is cyberspace. And cyberspace is a new environment. They are seeking to retain or to gain military domination. They look at it in a military sense. But it's a quite profound perspective because it's not about here is a machine like my computer or here's a new bit of technology entering into the previously existing geographical uh, uh, area of my air and my, and my room, my space. We are entering into a new and additional environment. And in this environment of cyberspace, we have new identities and new rights. So the right to privacy originally came about with the invention of the telephone. Right? People, the, the, without before the invention of the telephone, there wasn't the question of the right to privacy. And um, the right to our, our identities which is obviously a very big thing, which has come out of the medicalization of the data surveillance of the thing, of, of to whom does our, 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 our metadata, to whom does the tracking of what, where we are, what our, what, how our phone is used, what our computer, when it's turned on, where it is, all that metadata, which is not the content of what we're saying, but the way in which people are linking together, to whom does this belong? And is my, my metadata part of me? Is it part of, and if it belongs to me, do I have the right to know every time it is used or, or, or accessed by somebody else? I would say we do, but this, and, and, and the great battle is going to be fought over this. And the great, the platforms who are now moving, it's a very good piece by Naomi Klein, looking at the, the shift of power uh, built around the way in which the platforms are moving in on the American state. Um, they are going to try and appropriate all that material for, for, to give them privileged access to it and to not allow us to know it. And that does give you a feeling, this is a wonderful metaphor, that you can't breathe in this space, that you are somehow the oxygen of cyberspace is being sucked away from us. So um, I, I think that's the way I, I think the, and therefore I think acceleration is like a two, it's too much as if it's taking place in our existing spatial context. And we have to understand the, uh, the, the staggering innovation that has been created um, as being actually of creating a, a new effective dimension within which we exist and within which we have complex uh, identities. Of course, this is the big discussion. <laughs> And then again, you know, the, the European Union is acting as if it were championing the question of, of uh, privacy and your right to your privacy. Yeah. Although I think male privacy was an institution before phones, but probably uh, of a different kind. Uh, but maybe I'm just saying this because of the, the Austro-Hungarian or secret policing <laughs> that we were ed excessively educated on. But, but that beside, there's, there's some uh, serious discussion happening in the chat and a lot of questions. And especially, please do note that uh, Misha Glenny just commented on the Trump situation, uh, but we have fairly limited time. So I would ask you to look at the chat. Um, there is a huge praise going on um, around Achille's um, comments and a lot of questions which I will not read all out, but there are some which ask about um, the African handling of the pandemic and specifically among others, Ima Uvase is asking if you maybe want to comment on how African countries have been expected to fail in their response to the current sanitary crisis. Uh, by the international, let's say, international press and and international community, whatever that means. That's a very biased term, of course. Would you like to comment on this? No, I mean, there is not much to say. Um, first of all, we're happy the virus didn't originate from here. 
<laughs> this is already a big deal. <laughs> That's cruel, but fair. <laughs> anyway, um, um, look, um, see, there have been different, there are different experiments going on. <clears throat> they are uh, serious um, experiments of abandonment that are going on, uh, especially in uh, the most tyrannical societies in the continent, where nothing is, there was no planning, uh, no infrastructure. Um, governments basically uh, have uh, uh, washed their hands on uh, their own population when they have not turned against them uh, prior to the virus. Uh, so, so in, in such a scenario, um, we have to expect that uh, uh, the results might be pretty catastrophic. Uh, the uh, pandemic is still in its, uh, I would say, its incipient uh, phase in most of the continent. It, it reached the, the African shores a bit later, uh, it is still evolving. As I was saying early on uh, in South Africa, we have not yet reached uh, the peak uh, of the epidemic. Um, we had a lot of problems with the confinement because in, in places such, such as Johannesburg, Lagos, Abidjan, Dakar, um, poor people, who form the majority of the city inhabitants need to move in order to survive, in order to make it from today to tomorrow. Uh, the rules of everyday survival go against the law of social distancing. For instance, you have to make a mass, I mean, bodies upon bodies, that's how uh, you make a living. So when you force people into immobility or immobilization, immobilism, you uh, expose them to a very big risk, which is the risk of hunger. So uh, in some instances, uh, many people found themselves facing the choice of becoming either the victim of the virus or the victim of hunger. So how do you make that, that choice? Uh, so confinement created a lot of problems. Um, as I can see a number of the majority of the African countries are moving now away from uh, the lockdown uh, phase. Um, but with no guarantee uh, that uh, uh, this will uh, lead to more positive results. Look, let me just end it on that note. There's no guarantee that anything uh, we were used to uh, will, will repeat itself. It's an open-ended uh, situation. Um, and as Anthony was saying, it's, um, it's very difficult to, to placate on, upon it uh, categories, concepts that were in fact really uh, uh, invented for a situation uh, that early on. Um, so we'll see, we, we are open, we'll see what, what, what was going on, we'll correct things where they, they, they go wrong that's the uh, the strategy the South African government, for instance, has has chosen. Thank you. In the meantime, in the chat, uh, there are a lot of comments um, about uh, about the discussion in Africa and adding a lot of nuance to the original um, formulation of the question, which was I simplified it significantly, just for the ease of the discussion. So please do check that out. Uh, and thank you. I feel for your, well, basically the, the end note. Uh, but before we wrap up the discussion, let me turn back to Anthony, who is 
after all, with his, uh, well, half a novel size of, um, of, a, of a, let's say, quick summary of recent history and how it can turn out is the, the or, or gave us the occasion for this talk. There is, um, there have been a lot of questions which aim in this direction, but let me just read out this one by, uh, by Ronald Menzel. What do activists need to do to prevent a dystopian future emerging from the current crisis with big capital becoming just stronger and authoritarian governments consolidating their power? Anthony, you have, I, I spotted you, you have been trying to give us hope and show a perspective, which is, well, quite tenacious of you and I'm thankful for that, even though I have a hard time sometimes finding that perspective, but we sincerely really do need that also for strategic purposes and just to, you know, um, muddle through the day. So right. Anthony, do you have something you, you tell activists to reach to turn to that's, that's where you, where you start? Well, I think, I think that, you know, I, I, I think it's really important that we don't think, oh, well, I've got to think of something positive. It's in a very bad situation. So I must think of something positive to keep my spirits up. So I'm going to say something positive because although I don't really believe it, this is not going to work. It won't convince anybody else. And um, it's like whistling in the wind. I, I, I did think we were in a very, very bad situation in January. I think the, the arrival of this virus is both terrible and has drawn a line, drawn a sort of stop to the, the, the reinvention of neoliberalism under Trump and Johnson and the, the kind of right wing populists that we are seeing the strong men around the world. And that this opens up something uh, shocking and, and new and we have to learn. And what we have, I would say to activists is, we can't do it on our own. You know, activists being as active as active as active will not shift. We've already said it's one of the lessons of the last 50 years. We have to work with other people. We have to create new kinds of alliances. We have to persuade people who are not by instinct activists. Maybe they're professionals, maybe they're scientists, maybe they're, they're feminists in a different way. We have, to, we have to build a different kind of uh, alliance and politics. And that no, doesn't mean we're not be, continuing to be active, but it means we're not being active in the same, uh, uh, if you like, to put it in an extreme way, self-righteous fashion. And that sense of being open, which Chile has just been talking to us about, of approaching our own politics in an open-minded way, being willing to change and work with other people. Alliances mean being willing to change yourself in that alliance. It doesn't mean everybody's got to join me and I'm going to stay exactly as I am. That isn't an alliance. No one's going to, that's not how you change um, and, and, and in a principled way without losing yourself. That is difficult and hard. Uh, but that's, so that's what I would say. No easy answers, but a, a, an opening has occurred. Historic opening is, is there and it will take 10 to 20 years, you know, but I mean, it's not going to happen this year. This is going to be a real, they're going to fight back. It's going to be really ferocious. Trump and company are going to throw everything at Biden to the, uh, the out outcome. I fear uh, the outcome of the American election and so on and so forth. There's going to be a ghastly situation with Brexit and Europe. But, but uh, underneath it, we know, we now know in a way that we didn't before. We now know that humanity can be better, that we can breathe, that we can live in a sustainable way on this planet. We know we can do that in a new way and we can build on that knowledge, which Chile is thinking, you know, we, we have the right to breathe. We will build a planet on which we all have the right to breathe. Thank you so much, Anthony. And I think um, you guys in an alliance have built quite a strong metaphor, metaphor uh, to end this discussion with. Thank you for your patience. And if you are looking for a bit more concrete action to engage in. Adam Ramsey is here for you to tell what you can do via open democracy. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, thank you very much. This more. discussion with Anthony Barnett, Theory of Frankis, yeah. Ashkil Mbembe, and I was Reka King of Pop. Over to you, Adam. Hi, Reka. Thank you, thank you, Reka. And um, at that moment, it flashed up saying that my internet connection is unstable. So if I'm a bit uh, you know, cutting out, then apologies. Thank you so much to 
all of our panelists. You've been fantastic and fascinating all in your own ways. Thank you to everyone um, who's been contributing brief and sometimes longer comments in the chats. I, you know, was reading them with huge amounts of interest. I have just a couple more shout outs for you. The first is that I've shared the link to Anthony's essay in the chat. Um, please do, uh, if you haven't already, please do share it with your friends and family. Um, we'd love to continue this conversation online. The second thing is that every week I send out an email where we gather together all the various ways that government around the world are um, attacking democracy and human rights and civil liberties. And you can sign up to this email if you go to opendemocracy.net forward slash Corona crackdown. We also in that email uh, try to gather up um, examples of social movements fighting back. If you want to submit things for me to put into that email, then also you can find details at that link, which just to repeat it is opendemocracy.net forward slash Corona crackdown. And the second thing I want to say is that this is a really exciting time for um, all of us who work at Open Democracy. Today, we have broken a major story in Armenia about the um, US government spreading disinformation there. Yesterday, we broke a major story here in the UK. We've been expanding uh, rapidly around the world recently, both our investigative capacity and also some, you know, had some fantastic analysis recently of which Anthony is but one part. So if you want to continue to see discussions like this, you want to continue to support our investigative work and also this sort of analysis and discussion, then I am afraid that as well as love and passion and excitement, it also relies on cold hard cash. So please uh, go to opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. We don't uh, rely on advertising donors. We don't have any kind of, you know, uh, shady owners in the background telling us what to do. We are um, independent journalism. And if you want to help build a better world, then we're going to need more like it. So that's opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Thank you so much for coming. And if you're in my part of the world, have a good evening. If you're elsewhere, have a good rest of morning or good night and see us next week where we are going to be talking about the uh, politics of work after coronavirus. And we're hoping to have David Graeber with us along with some other fascinating panelists so we'll hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Rika. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.